Hello and welcome. My name is Dylan. I am a humanities tutor here. And today I wanted to give you an overview of Greek theater and specifically why Greek theater is important for understanding the rest of theater traditions throughout time. This is gonna be useful to anyone who is studying for their drama GCSEs or someone who's about to go into IB theater and wants to brush in brush up on some of the most important theater traditions. Okay, so when we talk about Greek theater, there's two different styles of Greek theater. There's Greek comedy, and there's also Greek tragedy. And we're gonna be focused primarily on Greek tragedy. Maybe I'll speak a little bit to Greek comedy uh, later on when we're about to end this, but really Greek tragedy is where we're focusing on. And the reason for this is that Greek tragedy is kind of the birth of theater. That's where all theater comes from. So if you like the opera, if you like, if you like American realism or musical theater or absurdist theater, surrealist theater, um, any of the other styles of theater you can think of, they all kind of date back to Greek theater. And none of them can avoid, at least in the Western tradition, none of them can avoid the references or the cultural connections that they have to Greek tragedy. And that's the reason why we want to get into this. So right here on the screen, you can see an image of some people in an ancient Greek theater. And we will get into sort of what all of this means, what the set is, all that stuff. But first, let's go through an introduction to what Greek theater was and where it came from. So Greek theater emerged out of the Greek religious tradition of the pagans and particularly the worship of one of their gods called Dionysus. Dionysus was the god of wine, of pleasure, of insanity, and also the god of theater there. And he's the god of theater, and so, of course, you worship him by performing theater. It was said that if you're performing theater, you were speaking for Dionysus here. All right, so there's a few terms that I want us to know about. The first one is dithyrum. You're going to see this on the screen. A dithyrum is basically an ancient Greek way of saying a sort of choral chant of some sort. Now, this was a chant that was composed in the worship of Dionysus. And we think that this is actually where theater originally came from. The earliest forms of plays that we can think of were actually dithyrums that suddenly someone spoke out and had their own solo part. So dithyrums were sung by an entire big chorus and the birth of theater is when you had one soloist with the chorus right there. So that's when, what we mean when we say that theater comes out of the dithyrum. Uh, chorus was next to my list. I've already kind of defined that. Chorus is when, well, you know the chorus is when a bunch of people are singing together. Anyone who has seen musical theater has a good understanding of what a chorus is. Okay, the other important things about Greek theater we have are masks. Uh, in ancient Greek theater, every actor wore a mask. And the mask was a way of connecting you to the character. You couldn't become the character unless you were wearing their mask and the mask almost took on a perception, an idea onto itself. So mask work is a significant amount of what Greek theater is about. And then there's this other term that I want us to talk about. This is catharsis. So catharsis is the reason for Greek theater. So in the Greek idea of theater, specifically Greek tragedy, uh, you would have this idea of catharsis, and catharsis is essentially the relief that you find after everything terrible has happened. If we think of tragedies, we think of we have our hero who is a flawed hero, but still mostly a good person, and by the end of the play, they are destroyed. And if you think to yourself about this, why, why, why would you want to see your hero become destroyed? It sounds terrible. How, how would this be happy for you? Well, think back on if you ever watch a sad movie. You know, a movie like Titanic or A Beautiful Mind or I Am Sam, you know, whatever your sad movie is, I bet that you have a favorite sad movie and one that almost makes you happy in a way. Well, makes you feel good after it's ended. I don't want to say happy for instance, but makes you feel good after it's ended there. 
uh, that's catharsis. You know, that, that's that feeling that you get of, hey, I'm safe and I'm fine. And I feel like I went through that emotional processing of all my negative emotions. And now I'm safe and happy and fine afterwards. That's what catharsis is. So the idea of Greek tragedy was all about trying to inspire catharsis in the audience that was going to witness it. So these are the terms I really want you to remember for Greek tragedy here. Now let's talk about the layout of a Greek theater. So this is the bird's eye view, the sort of blueprint print of it. And there are uh, three specific terms that I really want you to know about. The first one is the theatron. Now, if you're looking at this image, the theatron should be pretty obvious. This is essentially where the audience was. Uh, we call that the theatron, and of course, this is where we get the word theater from. So the theatron is just where the audience sat, that's simple. And then in the middle, we have the orchestra. Uh, this kind of functions exactly like an orchestra pit would function today, except for the orchestra in Greek theater is actually the chorus. So this is where the chorus would be. The chorus wouldn't actually be on stage with the rest. The chorus would be in this little middle ground section here. And when you think about this, the chorus is usually a representation of town elders for the story. We are supposed to be seeing this story through the eyes of the chorus. So they are this extra little section between the audience and the main characters. And they help us guide our direction, guide who should we be following, who should we be caring about. The chorus is going to tell us that. All right, and so the next section that I want you to know about is the scheme. Uh, this is, it, you might have guessed already, where we get our modern term scene from. And the scheme is the stage. It's just the stage right here. Okay, so we have the stage. This is where the chorus wouldn't be here, but our lead actors would be here. Our Oedipuses, our Antigones, our Medeas, they would all be on this stage here. That's it. That's simple. You understand it. So now let's talk about some of the major playwrights of Greek theater. And the tragedy of Greek theater, although it's going to make it easier for us, honestly, is that when it comes to Greek tragedy, there's only three great Greek playwrights who have survived. Now, we know that there are actually hundreds of ancient Greeks who wrote plays, but unfortunately we only have three great Phrygians and actually only one comedian uh, has survived. I might talk about him later, but we have only three great Phrygians who have survived. Uh, why only three who have survived? Well, many different reasons. You know, history is chaotic and there's reasons for that, but you know, wars are fought, libraries are burned down, uh, we didn't have the internet back then, so you couldn't have a digital copy of anything. And even with these three playwrights, we have definitely lost some of their plays as well. But it should be mentioned that the ancient Greeks valued these three as the best Phrygians that they had as well. It's probably the reason why these three survived. All right, so our first one we're talking about is Aeschylus. So Aeschylus is important. He's kind of the early, early uh, playwright, he's the first surviving playwright who we have. And X, by the way, the time period that we're talking about here, this is classical Athens. So we are talking about Athens around 440 BC to 400 BC. Around that time is when all these playwrights are happening. And also around this time as well are all the other characters you're undoubtedly going to recognize for if you're taking a Greek or world history course. Uh, this is when Pericles is in charge of Athens. This is when you're going to hear about Socrates and Plato and Xenophon and any of those other great Greek thinkers, writers, heroes, anyone that's gonna pop up in history. And that also makes these playwrights a lot more significant because they happen to be writing at the same time that Athens is such a rich cultural place. Oh, and why Athens? Well, Athens was the literary capital of all of ancient Greece. And we know that there are theaters in other parts of Greece, but all of our playwrights we have are Athenians. So when we say Greek theater, what we really mean is Athenian theater. All right, anyway, let's talk about Aeschylus for a second. So Aeschylus, like I said, 
the original Greek playwright. And he does something quite radical. So I mentioned the dithyram kind of becomes theater when there's one man who starts singing by himself. Aeschylus adds another one. So Aeschylus kind of invents the whole idea of dialogue. Before Aeschylus, you wouldn't have two people talking together. Aeschylus invents that. So let's talk about major plays by Aeschylus, and then we'll move on. The most major play that you need to know from Aeschylus is called the Oresteia. It's actually a collection of three different plays. Uh, but essentially what the Oresteia says uh, is there's three plays. There's uh, the Agamemnon, there's the Libation Bearers, and there are the Furies. There. The Oresteia tells this epic story of Agamemnon returning from Troy only to be betrayed and murdered by his wife, and it is up to her, their daughter, and their son to conspire to then kill their mother. It is a very bloody story, and the son is actually driven insane by the murder of his mother, as you would expect, and he then has to run away. He then runs to Athens, where they have a trial, and it turns out that he is forgiven for his sins. That's the Oresteia. Um, the Persians is a play, another tragedy by Aeschylus, uh, but it is interesting because it's a tragedy written about the enemies of ancient Greece. So if you know anything about Greek history, you'll know that uh, Greece and Persia got involved in these things called the Persian Wars. If you've ever heard of the Battle of the 300 Spartans, that's part of this uh, Persian War right here. And Aeschylus wrote a, wrote a tragedy about the other side. And I think that's really unique in history. We don't see that very often, and particularly for the early days of theater, to have someone writing a tragedy from the other side, it's incredible. Anyway, that's Aeschylus. We'll skip Seven Against Thebes right now because there's another playwright who I want us to talk about first. Okay, Sophocles. Sophocles is probably the most famous of the ancient Greek playwrights. Uh, he follows right after Aeschylus. And the thing that I think you need to know about so Sophocles, Sophocles is thought of as the one writing the tragedies of the great men, essentially, or great women as well, because Antigone and Electra are both women. Uh, but they're tragedies in the sense that the hero is, you know, maybe flawed, but he's flawed in the heroic way. Uh, there. So we have uh, his most famous plays, Oedipus Tyrannus, or you might know it by the name Oedipus Rex. Uh, this is a play about this king called Oedipus, who finds out that there is a plague attacking his city, and he tries to discover what is causing the plague, only to meet the most terrifying revelation possible, the revelation being unbeknownst to him because he was uh, raised uh, by a shepherd. Uh, he never met his mother and father. Uh, unbeknownst to him, he actually killed his father and then ended up marrying his mother. It's this horrible revelation that Oedipus realizes. And in doing so, when he does that, he gouges his eyes out so that he can never see again. It's an incredibly dark, dark tragedy, as you know, frankly they all are. Um, after Oedipus, um, you know, relinquishes the crown of Thebes, uh, his two sons rise up against each other to fight to see who will become the next king. That's actually what that play before I was mentioning, The Seven Against Thebes by Aeschylus, that's about that story right there. Anyway, the two sons both die, and the story of Antigone is Antigone trying to, Antigone is Oedipus' daughter, she is trying to lay her brothers to rest and honor them. He also has this uh, tale called Electra. Uh, Electra is one of my favorite plays. Uh, it's telling the exact same story that Aeschylus is telling with the Oresteia. It's just telling it from the perspective of Electra. Electra was the daughter of Agamemnon and Clytemnestra. She's the one who conspires to kill her mother in vengeance uh, for the death of her father. Yeah. Ajax is a story from the Trojan War. Uh, Ajax is one of the greatest warriors of the Greeks, but when he feels dishonored, he goes insane, tries to kill a bunch of his own men. Turns out he was insane, so he just killed some cows, and then he commits suicide. 
Um, again, for the Greeks, it's all about the catharsis. If you're thinking, why are these stories just so dark and so depressing? Well, A, they're tragedies, but B, they're supposed to deliver that catharsis to you. You're supposed to go through that emotional release there. Now on to the final of the great Greek tragedians. This one is Euripides. Uh, Euripides is, I think I just said Sophocles is my favorite of uh, the Greek playwrights, and I'm changing my opinion right now. Euripides is amazing. Euripides is amazing because you can tell that Euripides has his own voice. He's thought of as the one who is writing stories about women uh, better than any of the other playwrights do. Well, we'll see about that. Our one surviving comedian hates the way that Euripides writes about women and satirizes him all the time. But for Euripides' sake, let's talk about his portrayal of women. Nearly all of his plays are about women. Medea is a play about a woman who um, marries a hero. He decides to call off the marriage and in vengeance, she kills their children. Uh, Andromache is a story about a woman who is married, Andromache, who is married to Hector, the greatest of the Trojan warriors. Uh, and it's about her suffering when Hector dies and she is forced to become a slave. And then once again, we have Electra again. This is exactly the same story as Sophocles' Electra. Euripides is just writing it from his own perspective. I saved the best for last. You might have wondered why I skipped Trojan women. This is one of my favorite of Euripides' plays. Uh, it is the story of the surviving Trojan women. This is after Troy has been burned to the ground. All of their husbands, all of their sons have been killed, and they are now being sold into slavery. It is incredibly unique and beautiful and incredibly sad and transcendent uh, story, and it still gets performed because there's something that we resonate uh, with it. All of their suffering, all of, all of the hardship that goes on with this. It is a really great emotive uh, movie. And there's, there, uh, sorry, I said play, but there's a movie I was just thinking of. There's a film adaptation of Trojan Women from the 1970s, and it's excellent. I highly recommend that you check out this version. Of it. Oh, there's also a great Greek version of Euripides' Electra from the 1960s. I have found it on YouTube before. I know it can be searched for on YouTube. Uh, so why don't you check that out as well if you're interested there. All right. And that's it. So I hope this was useful for you. I hope that this gave you a good overview of some of the major players of the Greeks and an idea as to the way that the Greeks approach theater there. Um, thank you. Hope it was useful and have a good, great day.